Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you to our inaugural conference of the CHAMP Network here in the press room of the European Central Bank and all of you out there in the live stream. The purpose of this conference is to make the CHAMP Network, the CHAMP Research Initiative, known to the broader economics community and the interested public. In the next three quarters of an hour, you will, among other things, receive a presentations or characterizations, descriptions of what the CHAMP network actually, this important large project on monetary policy transmission in Europe uh, uh, does. Uh, then there will be a number of sessions where we feature external research and internal research from the CHAMP network about the priorities. Also, please pay attention to the poster session in the for, uh, here in the lobby, where additional research from the Chant Network will be displayed. But before that, let me introduce uh, Mrs. Isabel Schnabel from the ECB Executive Board for the opening speech. As you know, Isabel Schnabel joined the European Central Bank from a research career broadly speaking, to the ECB board. In her previous uh, position, she published in top economics journals like the Review of Financial Studies, the Journal of Economic History, the Journal of International Economics, among other, others. Now here at the European Central Bank, she is in charge of monetary policy implementation, research, and statistics. She is one of two board members who regularly makes the presentation to the monetary policy meetings of our governing council, which is the main decision-making body, alongside with Philip Lane. Therefore, I'm very pleased that Mrs. Schnabel accepted our invitation to deliver this opening speech and appropriately for our undertaking, the CHAMP Network, it's on the topic of the state contingency of monetary policy transmission. Please, Ms. Schnabel, make your way up to the lectern. Your, the floor will be yours. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you very much to uh, Philip for the kind introductory words. It's a great pleasure for me to give the opening uh, remarks at the inaugural conference of the CHAMP Network. And you will hear much more about the uh, CHAMP Network uh, later, but uh, let me just already now mention what the goal of the network is, which is to enhance our understanding of how monetary policy transmits to the European economy amid unprecedented shocks, structural changes, and shifting inflation dynamics. So I think it's fair to say that we've learned a lot about monetary policy transmission over the past years. And if I had to summarize what we learned in just one sentence, I would say that we learned that monetary policy transmission is state contingent. So what I want to do today is I want to go through the three stages of transmission, and I would like to answer the following three questions, or attempt to answer. So first, what affects the speed and strength of transmission of monetary policy to financing conditions? It's the first stage. Second, how sensitive are firms and households to changes in financing conditions? And third, how are changes in demand transmitted to changes in inflation and output. So let me start with the first stage of transmission, which is from policy rates to financing conditions. So one way to summarize what has happened to uh, financing conditions uh, is to look at loan and deposit betas. And if you look at those, what you can see is that there has actually been quite a strong path through to loan rates, 
Whereas when you look at deposit rates, you can see that the transmission to overnight deposit rates has been relatively weak, whereas the transmission to the term deposit rates has been uh, somewhat stronger. And you, you can see on the right-hand side that, of course, also the term deposit rates went up much more than the overnight deposit rates. So one explanation uh, is uh, competition in uh, banking, which matters uh, for uh, transmission. And if you look at these charts, uh, you can see that uh, for deposits, there is actually a stronger path through in more competitive markets, whereas for loans, shown on the right-hand side, there is stronger path through in less competitive markets, which is probably also what you would have expected. Uh, at the same time, uh, we see that over time, bank concentration in the euro area has gradually increased, implying lower competition, and this may explain the stronger path through in loan markets than in deposit markets in historical comparison. Looking at volumes, we have seen quite strong transmission to loan volumes, and that is shown on the left-hand side, both for loans to firms and to households. So you can see that net lending flows have almost come to a standstill at the end of 2022, the beginning of 2023. On the right-hand side, you can see what happened to deposits. And there, we have seen a massive shift from overnight to term deposits, which, of course, is not very surprising given the rising interest rate differential. Our bank lending survey, and here I'm showing loans to firms, but actually the picture for loans to households uh, it looks pretty similar. We have seen a tightening uh, of credit standards. You, you can see that on the left-hand side, and you can see this is mainly driven by the yellow and the red bars. So uh, this is risk perceptions and risk tolerance. And at the same time, as shown on the right-hand side, there has been a sharp drop in demand, mainly due to higher interest rates. Importantly, both of these seem to be fading out, which could be an indication that we are now past the peak of the transmission uh, to financing conditions. Fortunately, banks' balance sheets are relatively strong. So uh, banks are profitable, banks have high capital ratios, and this implies that there is little risk of financial amplification. And this is a very different situation from what we've seen at other times, especially, of course, around the global financial crisis. Moving uh, to financial markets, you can see on the left-hand side that long-term risk-free yields have tightened significantly but the term premia, and these are the yellow bars, they actually remain quite compressed. And one of the reasons uh, could be the stock effect of the still very large monetary policy bond portfolios. Stock markets now stand higher than they did in June 2022, so just before the tightening cycle started. And as you can see on the left-hand side, in the red area, this is, to a large extent, driven by compressed risk premium. And the same is true in credit markets. If you look at the right-hand side chart, you can see that credit spreads have uh, actually come down quite a bit since the start of the tightening cycle. So from this side, we've actually had an easing of financial conditions. Let me now turn to the second stage of monetary policy transmission, which is from uh, financing conditions uh, to firms and households' uh, behavior. And I will argue in, in this section that there are good reasons to believe that the transmission to firms and households may be weaker or slower than it has been at, or than it was at other times. So one factor is leverage. Uh, so leverage is actually quite low compared to other periods. So look at the left-hand side chart. So there you see firms' leverage. 
And I think it's quite remarkable to see that since the global financial crisis, there has been a downward trend in firms' leverage, which then implies that higher rates uh, are going to have a lower impact. Uh, if you look at the right-hand side, uh, you see data from our household finance and consumption survey. And there, at least if you look at the bottom 50% regarding wealth, you can also see that the debt-to-asset ratio has come down. There are sectoral differences. And uh, one important feature is that services have gained importance in the economy. Services are less capital intensive and less interest rate sensitive, which may again weaken monetary policy transmission overall. Um, on the right hand side, you see the results from uh, a survey that we uh, conducted uh, among uh, law, uh, larger corporations. And uh, what you can see there is, uh, I find quite striking, namely that uh, the, uh, the services firms reported that they are basically not affected. A large share report that they are not affected by higher rates, at least not directly. So normally, one important uh, channel of transmission is the labor market. Uh, however, this time, the labor market has been very resilient, which again tends to weaken monetary transmission. At the same time, Households in the euro area are saving a lot. And you can see that on the right-hand side. And this is actually, I, I find this quite striking. So maybe it's not surprising that savings ratios, this blue line that they uh, soared at the beginning of the pandemic. But what we see is that even though they, they, they have come down, they, stand, um, they still stand below pre-pandemic averages. And this is in spite of the high volume of accumulated excess savings shown in yellow. And it's also quite striking to compare this with the US. So in the euro area, we currently have a savings ratio uh, of around 15%. In the US, the savings ratio is below 4%. And of course, the flip side of that is that consumption in the euro area is much weaker. Another factor is cash buffers. So uh, we, we, uh, we are seeing that both firms and households uh, are holding high levels of liquid assets. And when you have a lot of liquid assets, there is less need to borrow at high rates. Of course, over time, these cash buffers may be uh, depleted. And if you look, for example, at the left-hand side chart, what you see is that there is this kind of trend in, in rising uh, uh, holdings of liquid uh, assets. Of course, it, it went up a lot uh, during the pandemic. It has come down a bit, but it still stands before uh, pre-pandemic levels. So, so far, there, is, there are no signs uh, of a depletion. And these high cash buffers could slow monetary policy transmission. Another uh, factor that could potentially slow uh, monetary policy transmission is the prevalence of uh, fixed rate loans. And as you know, there is a lot of heterogeneity across countries. So in the euro area, we have some countries where mortgages are mainly at fixed rates, others where mortgages are mainly at variable rates. But there's also, of course, some heterogeneity over time. If you look at the left-hand side, which shows uh, corporate bonds, you can see that uh, if you look at the blue line, and this is the high yield segment, you can see that uh, around 2020, uh, the share of corporate bonds maturing uh, within the next three years uh, was uh, relatively small. I think you can, uh, maybe you, you cannot even see it because it's too small, but it's around um, uh, 15%. Uh, but it has actually gone up quite a bit, and it now uh, stands close to uh, 40%. So eventually, the loans will need to be refinanced at higher rates, and in that sense, the tighter monetary policy is going to have long-lasting effects. Let me turn to the third stage. So what is the impact on economic activity and inflation? 
And uh, it seems uh, that there is a consensus emerging that we may be facing a quite bumpy last mile. So this shows you uh, the evolution of HICP inflation in the euro area. And in fact, the first part of the disinflation was quite impressive and faster than many of us had thought. But this was largely driven by the reversal of previous supply side shocks, energy, food, bottlenecks, whereas domestic inflation has proven much stickier. And of course, this is where monetary policy transmission is biting. There has been a lot of research, including within the ECB, using uh, micro price data in order to analyze the impact of large cost push shocks. And I think this type of research is incredibly important, and I know it's also going to be uh, part of uh, this network. Uh, a common finding, as shown on the left-hand side chart, is that uh, the frequency of price changes has increased quite significantly. And according to uh, this data, which is coming from Banque de France, it has by now uh, come down and more or less uh, normalized. So this higher frequency of price changes uh, is given as one of the reasons why the Phillips curve has steepened and has actually been much steeper than we had thought. I mean, remember not so long ago, we were all talking, talking about the, uh, the, the flat uh, Phillips curve, but actually we have seen uh, quite a bit of a steepening. The soft landing narrative relies on a steep Phillips curve also on the way down. And actually we have seen, if you look at the right-hand side chart, we have seen that uh, initially the decline in inflation also has been here, uh, this shows core inflation, has been uh, quite steep. However, we also see a bit of a flattening out, and so this is something that needs to be watched. I believe central banks should not take credit for the disinflation caused by the reversal of supply-side shocks. But I think we can take credit for keeping inflation expectations anchored. And this is shown on these charts, and uh, there are many, many others you could look at. So anchoring inflation expectations is a crucial uh, channel of transmission, and here monetary policy has worked very well. Some risks remain. One aspect that we are looking at uh, uh, very uh, vigilantly is the development of unit labor costs. And so here you see the two components, nominal wages and labor productivity. Wage growth remains relatively strong, but it seems to be gradually easing in line with what we have in our projections. The more concerning part is productivity growth, which is shown on the right-hand side. So we've had negative productivity growth now over several quarters. And the important question is, what part of that is cyclical, meaning that it's just going to vanish over time, and which part of that could be structural? If you look at the GDP deflator as a measure of domestic inflation, you can see that unit labor costs uh, unit labor costs continue to contribute strongly. So these are the green bars, whereas the contribution of unit profits has come down quite a bit, which seems to point uh, to a higher absorption of higher costs through profit margins. But this is certainly also an area to be watched because uh, our projections assume uh, quite a bit of absorption of higher costs through profit margins. The biggest concern is clearly services inflation. And if you look at, at these charts, you can see why. So on the left-hand side, you see non-energy industrial goods. On the right-hand side, you see services. And you, you can see that for services, still around 90% of goods have inflation rates above 2%. So we haven't seen the same uh, reversal as the one that we've seen 
uh, for goods, shown on the left-hand side. Staff analysis uh, from the ECB has shown that the wage price path-through is much stronger for services, and one of the reasons could also be the quite resilient uh, demand. And on the right-hand side, you, you can see the PMIs, which have uh, moved clearly into expansionary territory again for services, not for manufacturing. And so this is clearly something to be watched, because the whole story about absorption of higher costs via profits relies on the fact that demand is dampened by monetary policy. But the question is whether the dampening effect on services is as strong. So finally, uh, we need uh, to look at uh, the potential risks stemming from new uh, supply side shocks. And one of them is geopolitical risk and energy prices. If you look at the charts here, you can see that so far the reaction of energy prices to geopolitical risks has been relatively mild. But this, of course, remains to be monitored. The second uh, potential new supply side shocks is coming from extreme weather events and food prices. And here we have seen quite large increases recently, as you can see on the right hand side. There's uh, one uh, uh, part of it is, it's related, uh, is related to cocoa, which suffered a lot from droughts, but there's also a more general upward move. And this partly seems to be related to the strong El Nino uh, episode that we've been experiencing. So to conclude, in order to understand monetary policy transmission, we need to look at all three stages of monetary policy transmission. We know that monetary policy is state contingent, but we need to learn more about the factors affecting transmission. And this is why this research network is so incredibly important. This is why I'm so happy that all of you are here and are contributing. Uh, to us learning more about monetary policy transmission. So thank you very much for your attention and I would be open for a couple of questions if you like. Hi, Diego Comin from Dartmouth College. Um, let me challenge one of the claims that you made about um, the role of fr the frequency of price changes on inflation. I think that the big question is why do firms change prices more frequently? And that's clearly um, the, the, the driver of, of the higher inflation, okay? And in my view, the reason why they are, they are changing prices more frequently is, is uh, that they are facing this capacity constraints that push producers to readjust their prices because now demand conditions are completely different and their supply is constrained. So the, the optimal response is to change prices. So the frequency of price changes, in my view, is just a, a, a consequence of, of something that is the two driver of, of inflation, which is the, the fact that producers face these capacity constraints. What do you, what do you respond to that? May we connect two or three questions? Uh, Benoît Mojon, BIS, uh, ve very uh, impressive and insightful presentation. Um, one thing you said about the anchoring of inflation expectations as um, um, somewhat independent from um, the um, effect of uh, supply shocks on uh, uh, aggregate inflation, I mean, you, you kind of hinted uh, to that, but to some extent, uh, with the initial hump in, in inflation, which came to some extent from supply shocks, you know, what it becomes and whether it goes to the um, uh, general price level and, uh, you know, monetary inflation as we know it, uh, their inflation expectations play a, a very critical role. So 
Uh, can you elaborate a bit on how you, you, you see these uh, spillovers across sectors and, and the role of anchoring inflation, inflation expectation in this context? Yeah, maybe one more question at the end of it. Hi, uh, Carlo Boffa from Politico. I wanted to ask, you talked about mortgages, but what about the transmission to uh, prices of real estate? Do you think was, uh, would you have thought that would have been more forceful, both uh, residential and commercial real estate? Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we have to uh, stop here because we, we need to, to move on later. Okay, so let me uh, try to answer in reverse uh, order. So on the, uh, on the real estate prices, I mean, first of all, there has been a lot of heterogeneity across Euro area countries. So uh, there are uh, some countries where real estate prices have come, uh, come down uh, quite a bit, uh, others where real estate prices are still rising. So a lot of heterogeneity. Uh, in general, I would say the, uh, the decline in house prices um, has been smaller than at least I would have expected. And uh, my explanation uh, would be that, uh, that this is coming from uh, a lack of, of supply of, of housing, that we, that we kind of have a, a structural uh, lack of supply of housing which kind of limits uh, the, uh, the downward moves. Um, so the, uh, the second uh, question, was uh, on the role of supply side shocks and inflation expectations. And of course, we all remember that uh, when we uh, discussed about the supply side shocks uh, initially, I mean, there was kind of this uh, more or less standard view that uh, this is something that we could look through. And I think uh, it, it became uh, clear that, uh, that, uh, that that was not uh, the case, that we had to respond. And uh, one of the main reasons uh, was uh, the need uh, to anchor uh, inflation uh, expectations. And um, uh, so it seems that, I mean, I, uh, I would like to stress that it's actually quite remarkable that we had uh, inflation moving up uh, to uh, double digit numbers and still inflation expectations remaining. I mean, of course they moved, they did move up, but uh, what we did see is that um, uh, we were able to convince both markets, uh, firms, and households uh, that we were determined to bring inflation down again so that the longer-term inflation expectations never really seriously moved away from uh, our target. I mean, they moved up a bit, but we were, uh, we were able um, to uh, contain that. And uh, I believe that was one of the uh, of the big uh, successes of, um, uh, of monetary policy. Um, and then on, on, on your question, um, I mean, there is, of course, there is uh, uh, a lot of research ongoing uh, about uh, the, um, uh, the factors uh, determining uh, the high frequency uh, of price uh, changes. Also here we have uh, at the ECB, we have quite a bit of research. And uh, so the, the standard argument seems to be uh, that uh, different from the type of like uh, calvo pricing, we have uh, state uh, contingent pricing where uh, when, uh, you know, the, uh, when um, the desired price uh, moves away, uh, far, uh, far away from uh, uh, the, the actual price, uh, then you get this, uh, this higher, um, uh, this high frequency of price changes, uh, but, but I, I, I'm not entirely sure that relates to your question, but maybe we can discuss uh, bilaterally. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure to uh, talk to you, and I'm looking forward to the following sessions, and I think now uh, Philip and others are going to give an introduction to the CHAMP network. Thank you. So hello again. Um, in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, um, Emmanuel Dean from the National Bank of Belgium, Diana Bonfim from the Banco de Portugal, and myself 
give you an introduction uh, to the CHAMP network. Uh, the CHAMP network is one of these large networks that we do every few years. This time it's the European system of central banks together, so the scope is European Union wide. And the, um, the speech we just have seen and the Q&A couldn't illustrate better the importance of the topic of monetary policy transmission right now, not only for the ECB, but also for many central banks around the globe, even, I would argue. It's not the first network. The Prisma network on price setting was just mentioned several times. There has been, after the great financial crisis, one on the macroprudential research, Mars it was called. There was some uh, around, uh, other years, there was one on wage dynamics. And actually, the very first one, and Benoit Mojean will remember the best because he was the secretary of the MTN, the first monetary transmission network, was actually the first Euro system uh, research network. Um, so, CHAMP stand, stands for Challenges for Monetary Policy Transmission in a Changing World. As many of these networks, it has a horizon of about two years. The motivation was already uh, touched upon very briefly uh, by Isabel's first slide. So the combination of, of events over the last decade and a half really warrant revisiting monetary transmission in the Euro area and in the European Union. Shocks were unprecedented. Structural change is going on on various fronts. The monetary toolkit, the monetary policy toolkit has changed substantially, and we have experienced the recent inflation wave and its reversal. Against this background, the core issue of CHAMP is how these factors, more recent ones, but also the ones after the great financial crisis, have affected the strength, the speed, and the heterogeneity across member states of monetary transmission of the ECB's monetary transmission, but also since it's ESCB, also in the EU of non-Euro area central bank policy transmission, or whether there are even some new channels to be paid attention to. In doing so, we have the ambition to play and to uh, uh, make, put enough emphasis on price setting and inflation. We divide, divide our work in two work streams, one a financial one on the financial transmission channels, and another one on the transmission through the real economy. The work program that we are, have established and are pursuing distinguishes two types of projects. One are individual research projects proposed by single researchers or teams of researchers from all over the European system of central banks. And the other, so-called coordinated cross-country projects, which are with a multiplicity of countries managed together to enhance robustness by having results from many member, member, member countries and to foster collaboration. Impressively, the number of projects with which we start is, stands at 196 individual projects right now. Uh, of which 111 are currently in Workstream 1 and 81 in Workstream 2. And then we have a few of the bridge projects which are straddling the two that we try to increase over time. Overall, 200, at this point in time, 287 researchers from the ESCB are engaged in those projects. And the continuation of the presentation by Diana and by Emmanuel will give you insights about emerging results. Because don't forget, we are pretty much at the start. The whole undertaking started in the fall of last year. So this is the inaugural conference. So the results are just starting. The true conclusions are going to come at the end. So let me move to explain to you how we run CHAMP in this one chart. Um, an important feature of the CHAMP network is that four national central banks, the Banca d'Italia, the Banco de Portugal, the Austrian National Bank, and the National Bank of Banges have joined forces with us, the ECB, to run this together for the whole European Union. European Union. And the five people that you see on the screen um, are uh, actually uh, compose the board that is, uh, that is guiding guiding all this. Myself, my name is Philip Hartmann. I'm the deputy of the research department of the ECB. 
I've already introduced Diana, I've already introduced uh, Emmanuel, and you will see in the, as chairs in the program also Maria Valderrama and Margarita Botero. We are supported by a range of advisors from other national central banks, experts in various aspects of our work program and of our priorities that I tried to briefly sketch before. And I will not go through all the names here. You can see them uh, on the screen. They are from uh, central banks that are not involved in the coordination and also from, from the ECB. Um, then we are supported by a range of consultants from outside academia. Again, the list is a bit too long to go through all of the names, but they range from the University of Chicago as far as that to Tilburg University or Leuven University, and you see the names uh, on the screen. And then, of course, we are supported by our back office. We are standing on the shoulders of Melina, uh, Papuzzi, Gon uh, Gonzalo Paspardo, and Raquel Gil, who keeps us going every day. At the end, we're going to uh, report via the research heads of the European System of Central Banks to the Governing Council our results in two years, two years plus time. And that is the point where I hand over to Diana. Thank you, Philip. So let, let me talk a little bit about uh, Workstream 1, where we have the goal of looking into the transmission of monetary policy through the financial system. And so our, our, our mandate here is to look into three main areas of interest. The first one is to think about the transmission um, to non-financial corporations, mostly through banks. And here, of course, this is, I guess, where the literature on monetary policy transmission through the financial system has already um, more extensive contributions, but for sure, there's a lot that we still have to explore. And here, some of the things that we want to highlight is to think about the role of country specificities, to think about the role of competition in shaping this transmission of monetary policy through banks to firms, and also to consider portfolio composition of banks. And to do that, one of the things that we have in our mandate is to uh, encourage the use of Anacredit more widely. So Anacredit is a data set where we have the loan level information about almost every loan across the, 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 the euro area. And so a lot of very good quality work is already underway using this data set. There's for sure much more that we can do with this very powerful tool, and we're working with that direction through CHAMP. Then the second area of interest where we want to advance knowledge is on the transmission of monetary policy through banks and non-banks to households. And this is an area where uh, for sure a lot has been done, but clearly not as much as on the transmission to firms and, and to some extent due to the lack of available data uh, comparable to these credit registers that we have on firms. And so indeed at European level, we, we do not have anything similar to any credit for households, at least not yet, but what we're trying to do with CHAMP is to, uh, to, to, to go deeper on the use of national credit registers that have this household data and hopefully with these uncover new findings that are relevant for the understanding of the monetary policy passed through. And then finally, we also want to go deeper on the role of non-bank financial institutions in monetary monetary policy transmission. And here it's important to look, for instance, into the substitution between banks and non-banks, to look into portfolio recompositions of non-banks, so there's many questions out there. And then there's one line at the end, which is actually a very crucial line, which is, I mean, we want to think about how bank and non-bank lending to firms and households is going to affect monetary policy transmission. But this does not mean looking only into loan, uh, lending outcomes. It means going all the way to the impact on prices and inflation, because ultimately this is what we have in our mandate. And so what you have on this chart here is, is the distribution of these many projects that Philip described that we right now have on Workstream 1. And you see, as you would expect, that the vast majority of them are in the first four blocks that are about monetary policy transmission through banks to the firms. But then we also have an encouraging number of projects on non-banks. We have much fewer on households, and so this is an area where we want to work much harder. And we have even fewer on the impact on prices and inflation. And, and again, this is where also lots of work is underway. So the, the network is starting. This is the inaugural conference, but I think we already can share some, some initial results, some things that are already underway. And so let, let me do these around, uh, around four blocks. And, and first, start with the more challenging one, which is precisely this full transmission all the way to prices and inflation. 
And so one thing that, that we can already say to you is that monetary policy shapes prices through bank lending. And to support this claim, uh, there's evidence coming from Sweden showing us that quantitative easing led to an increase in producer prices, and this works mostly through the firms with higher levels of leverage. Then, on top of this, one project that we're working on is to try to understand how banks' market power and consumer price elasticities are going to affect the transmission of monetary policy to inflation. And here what we want to do is to think about the firm as being squeezed in between the pressures exerted by the bank's market powers and the demand elasticities of consumers. Then on non-banks, uh, I mean, I mean th there's also interesting work underway. Let me highlight these results coming from, from Denmark uh, that show us that the rise of non-bank financial institutions affect the transmission of monetary policy. So uh, these non-banks increase credit supply after monetary policy tightening, and this is both relative to banks, but even in absolute terms. And then the authors of this paper show that this has real effects on investment and on household consumption. So then, then we have a block on, on transmission to firms, and this is, as I said already, this is a block that could be 10 slides and, and we would have many exciting results to share. Let me just highlight a few, uh, highlight a few of them. And so, for instance, there's a paper that it, that's going to be in the program of the conference, so you're going to be able to see it later, showing us how the green transition affects the transmission of monetary policy. And so what the authors of the paper find is that when monetary policy tightens, lending is relatively less constrained for the green firms. Then there's also evidence coming from Italy about the role of cash holdings, and so this is, this is an aspect where there, there's clearly more research to, to be done. And so for Italy, what the authors find is that banks uh, lend more and with lower interest rates to cash risk companies, and so this has important effects for monetary policy transmission. Then as Philip mentioned, I mean, be, be beyond these bottom-up projects where researchers have contributed with their ongoing work and early ideas, we're also leading these coordinated cross-country projects where we want to really steer uh, research in, to, to address some of the questions we have in the mandate. And so in, in, in this field, we currently have underway a project about the transmission of monetary policy through banks in smaller area countries where the transmission seems to be somewhat weaker. And so here there's a team uh, of researchers from different central banks across the, the ECB looking into um, two possible reasons, at least, for why this transmission can be weaker, and the top candidates are market power and the role of foreign bank ownership. And then finally, on households, um, there's, there's evidence on, uh, for instance, how different characteristics in mortgage markets and housing markets are important to shape the transmission through bank lending. If, so for instance, when we have more variable rate mortgages or a higher rate of home ownership, this is going to amplify the effects of monetary policy transmission. And also here, as I told you already, we really want to push more research uh, in, in this area. And so here we also have coordinated cross-country efforts to, um, to, to work on the national credit registers that have household data. First, to establish a set of stylized facts that allow us to better understand the transmission, and then to go deeper on understanding some differences in, in this transmission. So let me move on to on the to the, the, the second work stream on transmission of metapoesy through the real economy. Here our mandate is uh, really putting forward the analysis of transmission through production networks, <clears throat> especially in a time of reorganization of global and local value chain. And uh, a second area of uh, where we have to, in, where we want to invest a lot is the interplay between uh, structural changes that are ongoing in our economy and uh, monetary policy transmission, either going, go, looking at how uh, these structural changes are uh, affecting monetary policy transmission, but also how monetary, monetary, policy, how monetary policy can uh, affect those uh, structural changes. Uh, you also see uh, on, the, on the right hand side of the, of the, of the, the slide how our uh, projects are uh, uh, distributed among the various topics. Uh, naturally, because data is uh, more easily available on, uh, uh, on structural changes, uh, a large fraction of the projects that are ongoing in our work stream are on the interplay between monetary policy 
and, uh, and those structural change. But you can see that uh, a very significant fraction of our uh, ongoing research is also about the transmission for production networks. This is due to the fact that more and more uh, countries in the Euro area and outside uh, and in the EU more globally have access to either detailed firm-to-firm -firm, uh, uh, transaction data that allows to characterize in a very precise way the, product, the, the, the way the, the, the production networks of our economies are, are organized or also using more uh, uh, detailed input-output uh, analysis. So, so there is a lot of work on also on the transmission through production networks. And uh, I would like to, to as, as Diana also highlight some first emerging results from our uh, analysis and focusing first on, on the production network dimension. Uh, we have already a very interesting uh, analysis based on uh, firm to firm transaction uh, data that uh, uh, was looking at how a firm uh, transmitted their uh, cost, the, the, the change in their input cost into their own prices through uh, firm to firm linkages. And uh, what was emerging from this analysis uh, uh, done uh, on, for using Belgian data was that uh, firms were in, were passing those only partially those uh, input uh, uh, cost increases into their own prices, and because uh, of the network structure and the input output linkages, of course those inc incomplete pass throughs are accumulated over the production network, which may uh, dampen and delay the transmission of, of monetary policy. Uh, an interesting result of that uh, of, the, of that uh, research was to show that. However, if in, in normal time transmission is, par, is incomplete, when firms are facing common shocks like the recent uh, energy price, uh, price increase, even if that period was not covered by the analysis, they tend to see that their firms tend to more uh, fully pass on uh, uh, cost change into their prices. Um, let me also say a few words about, uh, uh, some word about the global supply chain pressure and the impact on, on, on inflation. Uh, we also have evidence that shows that these global supply chain pressures have played a, a role in recent Euro area uh, uh, inflation development and that these pressures tend to, add a, a, to have a persistent and unshaped effect on inflation due to the nature of of those pressures which are, which are by nature somehow persistent, but are also, have also cumulative effects over the value chain at the various stage of, of productions. Uh, in product, in the, the setting of production networks, I want to mention two initiatives that is ongoing in the, in the CHAMP network to have coordinated exercise. So as I said, more, more and more countries have access to detailed firm level uh, B2B transaction data. <laughs> And in the context of CHAMP, uh, I think like six countries have uh, uh, this type of, an, of, of data set available and that will allow us to better understand which firms are the most affected by uh, uh, monetary policy shock, for instance. That's one, one so it will, it will give, uh, increase our comprehension of the heterogeneous uh, transmission of monetary policy in the economy. Uh, in complement to that micro-based uh, analysis, we also uh, plan to uh, develop uh, a, a more uh, a model, uh, some, some new Keynesian model uh, uh, using uh, multiple country data with multiple sectors and input-output linkages. Basically, what we want to do with the help of our one of our consultants, Elisa Rubo, we want to bring uh, our econometrica model to the uh, Euro area data. Um, can move. Um, let me be quick on the uh, other two uh, uh, types of result, results that we have. We have some papers that are already documenting uh, some interesting uh, real effects of the uh, of monetary policy in in, uh, in European country. Uh, we have evidence that uh, accommodative monetary policy uh, tend to somehow uh, have a, a, a 
positive effects on uh, on potential positive effects on, on productivity growth by first improving capital allocation uh, 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 sorry uh, efficient allocation of, of, of inputs and also by uh, reduce by increasing sorry increasing competition among firms because they sti we, uh, accommodative monetary policy stimulates the growth of more the growth of small firms compared to large firms. Uh, we also have evidence that monetary tightening on the opposite may uh, uh, affect negatively uh, competition by increasing comp concentration among large firms, especially by uh, because they are uh, reducing entry rate. Uh, it reduces entry rate in the of, of firms in the economy. Um, and, uh, uh, another results on the real effects of monetary policy is related to labor markets, which was uh, mentioned in the, in, in the introduction speech. Uh, we, we, we have uh, evidence that a tightening of monetary policy seems to amplify uh, employment fluctuations over the business cycle uh, significantly more than, when, uh, than an exponent, exponentially uh, monetary policy shock. Finally, I think we have to say a few words about carbon transition. Uh, it's a really, a, it's, it's, it's an important topic in the, in the context, in the current context. And uh, dear, without coming with definitive conclusions, let me mention one, one contribution uh, based on, a, on the new, new Keynesian uh, models with uh, environmental uh, externalities that tend to indicate that conventional monetary policy is an untargeted climate instrument and therefore it should focus more on price stability, but uh, that uh, there is room for, uh, for uh, like unconventional monetary policy effects with, through the, uh, the corporate bond, some, some tilted corporate bond purchases that can accelerate, accelerate the decarbonization of the economy even if that effect is relatively small. So, um, that leads us to conclude this short introduction of the CHAMP network. Uh, this busy slide that you see is the last one that shows you a bit the activities we are running. The skeleton of the CHAMP network is a series of workshops. We have around three a year. Then we do trainings, both on data, like complex data, like big data, like Anacredit, um, or on methodologies, modern new methodologies to research on monetary transmission. We also have an online seminar series uh, going on. And then, of course, there are these public conferences, which this one is the first. There will be a concluding one. We don't know yet whether there will be uh, an intermediate one. Um, so, you have seen the people uh, who run the CHAMP network. If you want to know more, you can have now very briefly, since we are pretty much out of time, the chance to ask a question or two. But otherwise, you can talk to us in the, uh, in the, in the corridors, in the breaks. So, um, uh, while you are gathering your thoughts, whether there is any questions, so if you have a question, please stand up and state your name and affiliation. Uh, there's no, is there no questions at this point? We've already congested a little bit with the long presentation, but uh, that was it from us for now. Uh, and uh, we wish you all success and uh, pleasure in following all the sessions on the papers from outside and from the win within the Champ net network. Thank you very much. <laughs>